Yeah. On Professor and Friends, welcome to the show. Tuesday night show. I appreciate you being here on a taco Tuesday. I know uh, a lot of people are out there probably having their tacos now, but maybe they'll take a uh, little break from eating tacos and join us on the show. I have a very special guest with me tonight who has agreed to take a little bit of time out of his busy day and visit with, I, I have with me, Brett Siegel from Our Overland Life. Welcome to the show, Brett. Thanks for having me. Appreciate you guys getting me on. You bet. I, I'm very interested to talk to you. I've, I've fell in love with your Instagram account um, because of the super cool van that you drive. And um, it is it just blows my mind uh, to think that somebody can take such a big, massive piece of equipment and make it go anywhere. And that just that's so cool. But uh, anyway, right. before we get to the rig, I wanted to ask you uh for those of us who have never met you i know you get out there you're you just got back from uh overland east you were at overland west so a lot of people may know who you are but for those of you of us who have never met you tell us a little bit about who you are and the man behind the beard the man behind the beard um <laughs> our, our overland life actually started off as our airstream life uh, we were going to travel full-time in a vintage airstream uh, and while we were in the process of renovating it to travel full time and get out of debt and save up money to be able to hit the road, at least for a year full time was, was the original plan. Um, we started going out on weekends and week long trips with a, a Jeep TJ and a rooftop tent. And then next thing you know, we're in Moab for a week and a half. And then we're in Colorado doing the Alpine Loop. And as we were preparing to make this trip and travel in the Airstream, we started to kind of fall in love with the Overland style travel mm -hmm. where we you move every night you get really remote um mm -hmm. when we finally got to the point to hit the road the airstream was done it was ready to go we dragged it around for about three months and we're just like man this thing's an anchor like we can't get to the camps we want to get you got to stay somewhere yeah. longer like we had just got on the road we wanted to move we wanted to go we wanted to see see as much as we could see so i mean it went from you know traveling with the airstream to parking the Airstream at a storage unit and traveling for three months without it and then picking it back up, moving it to a friend's side yard that would be kind of on the route of where we were headed and then continue to travel for more months. And next thing we're up in Canada. And I mean, it was probably the first two years, two and a half years, we hardly used the thing. I mean, we used it for ski season to go snowboarding for like three months, get the Epic Local Pass mm -hmm. and kind of go do the Colorado, Salt Lake City, and California Tahoe areas, and right on the pass, and then mm -hmm. we the thing again and back in the trucks. So I mean, it was just kind of cheating when you're in it. It's really nice, but it sucks to drag it around. <laughs> so, <laughs> I heard yeah, that. Yeah. Well, I know you've got. Uh, I got to meet uh, one of your kids. Um, you know, that's a, that's one of the questions we get asked a lot on the show is about overlanding with children. Um, and doing that full time. Um, how, how does that work for you? Do y'all do homeschool? Um, do they enjoy it? Uh, what's, what's that experience life with your kids? So we actually have different kinds of kids. We've got the dogs. Uh, Lizzie and I weren't actually able to have Hello. kids. Um, yeah. So we've got a couple of pups. We started with three. Unfortunately, one passed away while we were traveling, but dogs are still, you know, similar challenge to uh, children, probably not as much, but they're limiting in their own ways. You can't do the national park. You just can't get them out of the car. Uh, they can't do any yeah. hike with you there. Um, you know, you've got to make sure they're up on their shots, especially if you're crossing borders like into Canada and whatnot. Yeah. You've got to find 
find people to do that. So um, we do have a lot of friends at Overland with kids, though, and I'm always amazed to see how well they do it in homeschool and ro- road school, they call it. Um, yeah. It's impressive to see these kids have conversations with adults that are four years, you know, they're four years old and they're talking to you like you're one of the guys in camp. Like it, it's always yeah. so cool to see. It's amazing how mature they are. Um, you know, living life on the road like that. And we, and we did see a picture of your pups in the, in the intro video there. Um, and so you're saying that you only have one of those left. Is it, is that what you, uh, one of them did you, you still have the two? We still have okay. two. We've still got, we've still got Maisie, which is the healer mix. She's about 40 pounds. And then we've got Dublin. That's the, uh, okay. little spicy ball of terror at, uh, nine pounds. <laughs> right. Well, I've got a I've got an English bulldog that travels with me, and uh, he's he's just like having a child. I mean, he sometimes he minds, sometimes he don't. You have to think about everywhere that you go, especially when it's hot because you can't leave him in the yeah. vehicle. Um, that's that's always a challenge when you have pets with you because you have to think about uh, if it's hot, you can't leave him in the car. Uh, are they going to be able to get out and go with us? Uh, some places don't allow pets and things like that. So that's always a challenge. Uh, you know, whether well, you have kids or pets, either one, um, it's it's still something that you always have to think about. One of the things we did on the van that uh, really helps with the dogs is we added a aftermarket remote start system and we set the timer to 60 minutes. So if we need if we are going into a grocery store and it's hot outside and you can't find a shady place to park, we both need to go in and run errands for whatever reason. We can get the remote start going, keep the AC going on high, and go ahead and and keep them cool. And we'll you know pop out and check, but we haven't ever really had it fail. So it's been a big thing. If you've got an automatic transmission vehicle, you can get to keep the AC yeah, running that's, that's, when you go inside. That's that's a that's really handy because it's you know a lot of people are. They, they see those dogs and vehicles and if the, if the, if the car's not running they're oh, they're on 911 with it, with the cops, you know, they're just all the time yep. making sure that the animals are taken care of and they care more about animals than they do about people. So you always got to be, be mindful of that. Um, when, well, you, when you're traveling what, like that, it can be what 90 degrees outside and inside the car can be like 120, 130 at least. Exactly. So they heat like an fast. oven. Yeah. hundred yep. percent. Like a hot pocket. Like a hot pocket. Well, I saw uh, you. You said you just got back from uh, Expo East, and also you traveled to Expo West. How was that this year? Uh, the shows were great. Uh, a buddy of ours, Adam, uh, owns Step Twenty Two Gear, so he builds soft good stuff. Uh, we do I've a lot of Adam on the show several times. Yeah. There you go. Well, we are photographers, and so yeah. all of the studio photography on his website, we've done a lot of the lifestyle stuff on his website. We've done. Uh, so we've got a, had a great relationship with Adam for years, not just professionally, but also as a buddy. Uh, and he needed help yeah. at the shows. He didn't know if it was going to be crazy this year, if nobody was going to go. And then we're just like, don't hire a bunch of staff. Just get us out there or get me out there. I'll come help. Take care of the show. Help you out. And uh, West Mountain West turned out to be pretty good. I don't know what the official numbers were. They were throwing around like 17,000 attendees. I never know if that's actually a legitimate number or not. Uh, it was busy, though. We were slammed the whole time. We sold out of a couple items that he had brought for that show. Uh, Expo West was also crazy. The tool rolls. I think he sold out all the tool rolls and a couple other items as well. And then same thing with East. You know, he sold out at Friday and sold out of stuff that he brought. Yeah. I mean, so Friday morning, people are there yeah. that they know he sells out of stuff. And they, they're there first thing in the morning when they're open and just to make sure they get what they want. But the attendance was great. Everybody was in a great yeah. mood. Um it seemed like people were shopping and happy and spending. And, you know, I got dragged into a couple of the different uh, round table discussions as well, which is always a good time. Um, you know, met some new friends, got to reconnect some old ones. It's the expos are great. They're really, really nice. Uh, nice way to yeah. get reconnected with the community in between traveling. That's true. That's, that's exactly what I like about them. Now, if you were to ask me, what is your goal in overlanding? It's not to go where another 15 or 20,000 people are. That's, that's not um, that's something true. that I dream about doing, but it does give you a few times a year to connect with those people that you only get to see maybe once or twice a year. And uh, I think they really have their, uh, their place in our, our society or our lifestyle in that, in that way, for sure. Well, in the camping on site now, so um, you know, always a way to go, you know, when you're camped on site, you've got, you right. know, once the show's over, you can go actually like have some quiet time with 
with some people there. And a lot of times when you travel there yourself, you've got a little time maybe beforehand. So before Expo West, I met up with a bunch of the Onyx guys, Chris Cortez and all them. And we started mm -hmm. in Moab and then Moab and then trailed from Moab to West and then met up with a couple people afterwards and trailed back towards Montana. So it's it's also a nice time to to connect with some people that are headed that way and maybe see where your routes link up and and you know again spend some yeah. more time around the campfire. That's true. That's true. That that's the best of both worlds right there. Best of both worlds. Um, so in your in your um, overlanding life, uh, all the all the places that you traveled, uh, give us a, a couple, two or three, maybe more of the highlights. Some of your favorite places that you've been that just have made the most memories out of all the all the other places put together. We we were definitely shocked by uh, northern Idaho and Montana, especially northern Idaho. Once you get above Boise, you're up in the forest. There's lots of we, we really fall in love with natural hot springs, um, you know, going out there and getting a good soak. There's a bunch of them in northern Idaho and the mountains up here are just absolutely gorgeous. I mean, we've been to Colorado. We've been, you know, Alpine Loop. We've done Uray and Silverton and, and a bunch of other back trails and a bunch of the BDRs. Mm -hmm. And they're beautiful. They're gorgeous, but they're the terrain isn't as rugged as that. But at the same time, it it it's more remote up here. Um, so you know, we've done the Idaho BDR. Um, we've done a lot of back roads in Montana, and it's more of the it's that really that northern Idaho, western Montana section. That's just the rivers are amazing. The mountains are gorgeous. The winters are harsh. The summers can be hot and smoky and fiery. But man, like the leaves just popped like a week or two ago, and so there's just yeah fall colors everywhere which you know being desert kids you know there is no such thing as fall there's summer and winter yeah <laughs> that's right and, uh, that's right that's right right and the desert the, and i guess we're spoiled the desert has tons of beauty as well you know the springtime when the wildflowers mm -hmm. are, are absolutely gorgeous in the deserts you know the the rainy season is beautiful everything's green and lush i mean so they have their own the sunsets are better than anywhere else so you know the western u.s you know it just keeps calling to us like we love it out here there's so much open land there's so much yeah. uh, availability to really get off grid, stay off grid, not have any service for three or four days. Sorry if we don't post for three or four days. That's usually why. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, just because we don't have service, right. and then we'll do a big jump when we get back. <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah I definitely <laughs> up here has, has been been really special. Um, Pacific Northwest is beautiful, but it's it's really wet, um, and you know we ran into a lot more locked gates up there uh, than we really expected. There's a ton of national forest, but hmm. a lot of those roads are cut off for logging. So I mean, you can be driving for right. hours on one long stretch of road, and every single side shoot you thought you were going to go explore to find camp is a locked gate. So it's, you know, well, not always what you expect uh, when you're going into something. Right. What about Canada? Where did uh, where did you spend some time up in Canada? So we went through. Um, we crossed over in Washington state, went to the BC overland rally. Uh, and then from there we cut kind of North and then diagonally East over towards Jasper, um, hit the national parks in Jasper, came down the ice highway. We got to Disneyland at the glacier and had enough of big crowds cut East from mm -hmm. there. And then found this dirt highway that went pretty much all the way down to Calgary. And so we were on that for like three days. That road, we saw more wildlife than we'd seen anywhere else. More bears, more rams, more uh, elk and moose, and I mean, you name it, we were we were seeing it. It was it was amazing. Um, so then we got down to restock in wherever I just said we went. Cut back over towards Banff and then drop back in towards Glacier. I ended up booking a photo shoot uh, last minute. And we had to fly out of Missoula. So we cut our trip about a week short so I could get on that plane and go do the work. So sometimes you've got to change plans uh, okay. to change flights to go do work, you know, if you want hey, to keep the, want to keep the gas full. <laughs> <laughs> well, I see Kara on here. Uh, Kara just had, uh, she is uh, Matt's wife. They do Ozark Overland Adventures. And Kara had. Uh, they've got a great YouTube channel that everybody needs to check out. And Kara just had emergency surgery. And we want to tell Kara um, that uh, we've been praying for you, Kara, and spree recovery. Hope you see you this weekend. And um, so, uh, but I was going to ask you, um, Brett, when, when you were talking about all these different, uh, this different, uh, you know, living in your, in your camper and, and taking the Jeep with the rooftop tent and, 
and different things like that. What what made you want to do this? Have you been an outdoor guy all your life? Is this just fell right into something that you love to do? What 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 really sparked you to make that move to not have the traditional lifestyle of a little white house with a picket fence? Um, I think being an Air Force brat when I was young, we did a lot of moving around. I grew up in Europe, you know, Germany and England when the wall was up. Um, you know, they were constantly moving probably every four years. So I think that that lack of consistency and having a, the a same place to live the whole time has always been kind of ingrained in me. Mm-hmm. Um, did Boy Scouts when I was young, did a lot of hiking trips, did, you know, film out Boy Scout Ranch and did a lot of that kind of stuff. Wilderness survival training, uh, hiking, backpacking, we spent junior high and high school in Tucson, Arizona. So plenty of desert there. Um, you know, you can drive for, you drive for 15 minutes and be somewhere to camp. You could jump on a dirt bike and head out the wash and be ripping up the mountainside in no time. So, mm-hmm. I mean, it was just, always some level of outdoors. Um, and then as I got older, you know, I started working, did the city life thing for a while. It was great, but it was definitely a rat race. I uh, went back to school when I was 27 to become a photographer. I uh, met my wife at the time who had never actually been camping ever. Uh, so I, I took her camping wow. for the first time and uh, just for a nice introductory trip, I, I took my, my O4 Tundra and threw an air mattress in the back under the shell. And we did uh, a week out by Death Valley and Salton Sea in California and did another week up in Big Sur area and did basically a two-week trip for her first out-of-the-gate trip, and she fell in love with it. So um, mm. helped, you know, obviously we were dating at the time, but as we've gotten older, we've we've wanted to go out and do it much, much more. Um, the more we lived in the city, the more we realized we like escaping to the countryside. Um, mm. So we kind of... We got to Phoenix. We were, uh, we were doing like a pretty hard push. I was working a corporate job. I didn't like much, but it paid well. Uh, get out of debt was the goal. Um, you know, we thought mm-hmm. we were going to have kids and that didn't work out. Um, so then we started asking what our life looked like. If we're not able to have kids or raise kids right now, what does it look like to us moving forward? So we had a big house. We thought we were going to have kids. Got rid of the big house, got a cheap house, moved a roommate in really fast track wiping out all our student loan debt every little ounce of debt we had you know we canceled all the all the netflix was canceled we didn't go out to dinner anymore we weren't going to movies anymore mm-hmm. sure we had a little rooftop tent but it was a tapui air it was cheap um <laughs> you know used jeeps yeah. uh yeah. nothing crazy you know yeti cooler and a homemade platform in the back and a couple bins and we were running um so we basically really just focused on save up cash get out of debt get on the road and we're like we're going to do a year we want to go on the road, do live the lifestyle for a year, and then we'll figure things out after that. We had so many family members, so many friends that had gotten older, like, hey, when I retire, I'm going to rent a motorhome. We're going to travel the country and see everything. And they got older and their health de- de- degraded. They weren't able you know, to hike anymore. They didn't have the mental capacity to do it anymore. Mm-hmm. Finances fell apart, whatever it was. They got they worked their whole life yeah. and then they weren't able to go do it. And it's like, well, we can still go hiking. We can still go paddle boarding. You know, if we want to ride dirt bikes, we can ride dirt bikes. If, you know, we want to go snowboarding, we can go snowboarding. We, ha- we have the energy to do this now. If we can just fig- keep keep some level of income coming, at the very least, make enough money to do it for the year and then figure out life again, where we're going to base and go back to work. So it was kind of a yeah. a constant build, I guess. It was, it was always there, you know. Um, but the decision happened yeah. together to, like, let's make this – what do we have to do to make this happen? Let's put a plan in place and then executed the plan and stuck to it. And it worked out. That's awesome. That's a great story. That's a great story. And we're going to get into what's been going on here recently and what you got planned for the future and talk about this um, gigantic van and a really cool build and your wife's build that made it into a really awesome magazine here lately. But before we do, Let's take a break for station identification and to say thank you to our sponsors. Stand by. I'm Mason Berry with Blue Line Overlook. Hi, I'm Jeff from Ray Rover. We're Jorge Adjusta of Liberty Wander. Hey, guys. It's Chris from More Expo. Mary with Switchback Outdoor Safe. I know from Rhino Belt Rod and Custom. Jeff with Bad Act Adventure Co. Where am I from Overland Pioneer? Adam at Step 22 Gear. Jordan from Andy Samuel Vlain. Worker from Autotronics in West Virginia. Hey, this is Aaron from Artemis. Hey, I'm Tyler with Yoda Adventure. You're not going to say hi to these people? <laughs> and you're watching. And you're listening and watching. You're listening to. You're watching. The professor. 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 Professor and friends. Professor and friends. Professor and friends. Professor and friends. 
Professor and Friends. Enjoy. Sponsored by More Expo, April 8th through the 10th, 2022. Linson Solar. U.S. Action Tracks. Big Iron Overland Rally. Artemis Overland Hardware in Springfield, Missouri. Blue Cell Coffee Roasters and Long Creek Overland Apparel. Thank you for sponsoring our show. So tell me um, anything that you would do different uh, starting over, looking back uh, years ago um, with having the house, selling it, getting rid of, going into this full time, having getting the um, the Airstream and, and the van, the, the Tacoma, anything that you would do different now that you look back? Um, you know, they say hindsight's twenty twenty. so now that you've got some experience on your belt, anything that you that you would have done different? I think uh, vehicle choice, rigs, all that is all the right progression for us. You know, you hopefully you learn from your mistakes. And if they're not actually mistakes, you learn from the, the inadequacies of what you did earlier. So, you know, the mistakes that you've made in the past or decisions that may not have been the right ones, you know, probably um, make you better on the future decisions. Uh, that being said, mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing I would have done is any property I had purchased in the past, I would have liked to have thought of it more as like an Airbnb rentable property or something that I, you know, could go and live in for a while, get it ready to rock and then have that extra residual income while we travel. Um, you know, having, a, you know, you lose some of that by hiring a management company, but at the same time, you know, moving forward in my life, I would like to purchase any land I ever purchased from now on out. I'd like it to be rentable. I'd like it to be an income property. I'd like it to be, you know, a somewhere I want to vacation or live myself, but B I'd like it to also right. be something that would pr provide more passive income to continue to allow us to travel. We can always book out periods of time where we get to use it. Um, so right. I think that's probably, I, I guess a, you could call that a regret if you want. I think it's just more of a, okay, now moving forward, I think I'd rather do it that way versus have purchased something that was, you know, right for how I wanted to live at the time or what I thought I needed or, or what have you. So that's probably the the biggest yeah. regret that I didn't do more of that when I had the facility or the ability to do that. Right. Well, a lot of people come on here and, and they ask the full timers, you know, how are you able to do this? What's your source of income um, and, and different things like that. So people people want to know that uh, that little bit of information, you know, if you could go back and, and change things and having an Airbnb uh, man, if you could have one in every state, of course, that would be the the ideal life. And, you know, you could block yourself off uh, a, a week here and a week there and just travel around, you know, and live in your own property and then rent it to, up to other people when you're not there. I mean, that'd be the dream life, of course. You, but <laughs> you, you just follow those 75 degrees. Uh, that, that'd be a good plan there. for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guarantee you. I told my wife uh, when we retire, we'll probably never see an Arkansas summer again. I'm tired of them. I, I can't stand it. The uh, hundred degree with an eighty percent humidity. It's just no thanks. It's just outrageous. So uh, I wouldn't mind coming back in the spring and the fall to visit family. But you can have the summers here in Arkansas. I'm done with them. That's how um, I feel about Arizona. Kara <laughs> said uh, something about your massive van. Um, tell us wh why did you go with the van and and what have you done to the van to make it so make it so capable. Um, we started off, uh, when we first hit the road, our full-time vehicle was a 2011 Tundra, uh, very well built superchargers on 35, uh, had a flip pack in the bed. I did a home build inside that. Um, and for what it is, it is the smallest traveling size with the largest living space. So when you get the camp, crack the flip pack, open the beds over the cab, you've got full standing room in the bed of the truck stand-up kitchen stove, mm -hmm. all that, which is awesome. It's an amazing living space when the weather's nice. Um, even with a rain fly on the thing, if you are in a massive rainstorm, I mean, we got stuck up in Coeur d'Alene. We ended up pulling into an RV resort because there was a snowstorm coming, and it was 800 miles in either, each direction to get away from it. So we had mm -hmm. the rain fly up. We had gone to Costco and picked up a little electric heater. We, ran, we carried an extension cord and a splitter, ran that inside. So we had our devices charging we had an electric heater going we were playing cribbage and watching movies on the ipad and basically sat this whole storm out parked for three days in an rv park because we that, that you can't close it when it's like that if you leave it open it's great but then you're not going anywhere um the other side of that is if you 
close the thing up when it's wet, you've got to find a sunny time to dry it or it starts to mildew, or you have to have the foresight to look at the weather and be like, it's going to be raining for the next five days. We're not opening. So we had set it up with a sleeping platform in the back. Obviously, part of that side was taken up by the kitchen. So me, the wife, the time, the three dogs, all four, or 14 days of our Canada trip, it rained straight. So we never even opened the flip pack that whole time. We literally just had this small little coffin in the back. We had an awning off the back and we had a fire where it was dry enough to have a fire. But like after 14 days of just wet and not having the full living oh. space, we're like, it's time for it's time yeah. for a van. But we're like, yeah. what van are you going to get that's going to go to all the places the Tundra was going to be able to go? There's not a lot. Uh, so we had kind of yeah. softly been looking for an E-Series converted van um we'd looked at some that were quigley's uh we'd looked at some of the huge run off-road ones that are really capable um and we found a guy that had the thing for sale for too long in a weird part of the country and he had made some unique choices on uh you know white bumpers with white roof racks and white steps and wasn't really advertised that well and i had a phone call with the guy and he'd done some of the things that i would have done if i'd been building it from scratch um so basically it's got a it's 2012 V10 E350 extended. Uh, you started life as a Quigley 4x4. Uh, it was then converted uh, with one of U joints kits that puts in uh, Moog progressive coils. The entire front end's 2013 F250 with a Super 60 front axle. Uh, it's got the Fox 2.0 U joint tuned shocks and then an Atlas relief pack. Um, and then we've gone through and kind of fixed some of the steering since we've got it. Um, it's basically got the narrower metric equivalent tire it's basically a 35 10 is what kind of what it boils down to so it's got a good narrow mm -hmm. tire but good size tire um i've added a rear, rear leaf in the back i've re-arced the rear leaves uh i'm working on an act set of active bump stops for it right now um and because it's custom that's not all well it could be a van one it could be a super duty one it could be so trying to piece together what it mm -hmm. all is to get something that's going to work right i'm also trying to have somebody build me a custom set of external reservoir shocks for it as well the Fox 2.0s are fine. The U joint ones, they get the job done, but they they could do a lot better job. Um, so I'm kind of yeah. hoping we work with Elka on the Tundra. So I'm hoping they they'll get some time opening up in their uh, design team and they can make something just for us for the van. So it's pretty capable out of the box. Yeah, did rip, I did rip the steps off the side. I had a buddy of mine out in Arizona fab me up a set of welded on sliders for it. So it's actually got real sliders now to protect the underside. Um, you know, just constantly mm -hmm. doing little tweaks to to make it capable and you know I'll probably do a sway bar disconnect kit on it at some point too that way the front end's got more more moving and things like that so but you know careful line choice you can get it through a lot of places that back end does stick yeah. out a little far though <laughs> <laughs> yeah I noticed the big booty on that thing uh it it's just large all over that's for sure well Kara said would would you advise uh, now that you have done this and lived in it? Um, would you advise building one or buying one that's pre-built? What What do you want to do? Do you want to go out and enjoy your trip, or do you want to go build a van? Um, you know, the Revels are 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 nicely built. The interiors are incredibly comfortable. Um, you know, the Mercedes aspect of it is probably its limiting factor. Uh, there are some things you can do to make that more effective. There's definitely lift kits for them out there. There's ways to increase the boost and make them more capable. Um, but it gets you out doing it. So, I mean, if you want to get out and do it right away, then get out and do it. If you want to spend time building a rig and if you're you're not able to go travel right away, but you are able to wrench on the thing after work and build out the inside and take take that time and build the truck and dial the suspension and go on little trips and and keep tweaking things from there it's two completely different answers to the same mm -hmm. question. What do you want to, what do you want to do? Do you want to go travel or do you want to be building out a rig? You know, and if you've got the means to buy one that's done and ready to yeah. go and you just do a couple of mods and off you yeah. go. Yeah. Cause it, uh, building out a rig is not a cool. It's yeah, it's not a quick thing. Uh, you could be talking a year, maybe two. Uh, I've been working on my FJ for almost five years now. And I was out there right before the show saying, man, I don't like this anymore. I need to, I need to change this right before I leave tomorrow. You know, it's just always something. Um, we, so it's. We tend to go after our vehicles. Somebody started them and then we'll go through and kind of correct the things they've done that make it better yeah. for what we do. So some of the heavy lifting's already been done. Um, it still isn't done by any means, but we, 
we we want it kind of a baseline and we know typically what we're going to do to a certain type of vehicle once we've picked on one and then we can go out and uh find one that's been started the right way at least right well and and your wife uh lizzie i believe is her name or that's what you call her um yep. has a pretty capable vehicle as well and it was featured in the yoda um what was it the the yoda off-road adventure guide on tread magazine uh not yep. very long ago so um still, apparently still she's still. gotten into building a, a capable rig as well absolutely um yeah we well, started off that's awesome it had a basic old man emu lift on it there was an open pickup bed and they had a cbi front bumper and had some some mud terrains on there when we got it and that was about it um and as we've got it we've you know went through a bilstein suspension on it that didn't quite do what we needed we switched over to elka uh rebuilt the rear leaf packs active bump stops uh but it's a you know put put a tent in the bed of it took the tent off put a shell on the back uh, we built a full drawer system and sleeping platform in the back she's got a c-tech battery to battery charger with solar a dometic fridge uh inverter you know, ability to charge things, uh, plus, you know, water filtration system in there and she can get in that thing and just go run girls trips and go do whatever pretty much trail she points it at. I mean, yeah, I think the next mod she gets is a rear locker, but, uh, you know, that little two seven with a manual transmission, yeah. it's open diffs and no, no easy buttons. It's a, it's just a sweet, basic, you know, she calls it work truck life, <laughs> like, you know, roll up windows and the whole nine yards. But the, <laughs> I mean, just goes, you know, it's light. It's a oh, short hey, wheel. Piece. Whatever so works. It does. And it's, whatever it's fun. Works. And it gets decent gas mileage. Yeah. It gets like 20 miles a gallon. You can't, can't go wrong with that. Wow. Wow. Well, when y'all, when y'all go out together, do y'all drive separate vehicles or do you go together in uh, what? Uh, I guess the answer is yes. Um, you know, depending on okay, the trip. Okay, I figured, I figured so. <laughs> yeah, it depends on the trip and depends on where and what we're doing. Uh, if there's going to be a lot of good, challenging, fun trail, she's absolutely going to bring her truck. She wants to wheel. She wants to drive the challenging stuff. Uh, if it's a new area we really don't know anything about, it's really nice to have the two rigs. One for, uh, one's kind of a scout vehicle. We can send the small truck ahead, make sure the trail is going to be adequate for the van to get to mm -hmm. or She'll pre-check some of the locations that we found online or on maps that may be a, a potential for camp. Uh, so she, we'll send her out for those. Um, but also means we can travel a lot more remote. So if we have the two vehicles and something happens to one of them, we've got another one to get us out of there and figure out how to go back and get the other vehicle. So it, if it's going to be an easy trip and it's places we've been before or we're relatively familiar with and we know there's going to be cell service and uh, we run to the Garmin's anyway, but it's nice when you kn know you have pretty regular service in an area. You know, we may just take the one vehicle, get to ride together, you know, enjoy each other's company. But sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, I want to listen to my podcast and she wants to listen to a book. And it's nice to be in your own rig. And if we see something, we'll just call it out on the radio. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, I've, I know we've got several listeners who tune in uh, quite a bit. And, and that's actually their ultimate goal is to have uh to when they go full-time is to have a van that they live in but they've also got a jeep that will travel together and that way they can have one that they live out of and another one that they go out and do some exploring so uh, i know that is a that is a huge interest in a lot of people's option um for those who are planning to do it full-time in the future so uh, I, th I think that's a great i think that's a great setup that you have uh, whether you want to take one out and, and stay in one or or take the other one out or just take both of them. You have a lot of options there. A ton of flexibility. Adding dirt bikes into the mix is uh, probably the next thing coming up. I, I just got her into dirt. So uh, once she mm -hmm. gets that going, we might might even start showing up with just the van and a trailer with two bikes on it or something. So we, yeah. we'll see. <laughs> so get really, really get wow. further up and really explore deeper into the woods and, and, you know, find even cooler places to camp and then move the van there. So uh yeah i hear you i, I i'm building a uh adventure bike i've got a honda nc700x and i'm on the tail end i've been working on it for about a year and a half now and i'm on the tail end i've got i got my lights in um my off-road lights to uh, put on there and when i get those on there i've already got my boxes i'm ready to go so um we, we're adding another aspect to ours as well i also see that you uh are into the side-by-side -side world i see you pulling the side-by-side -side around with your van a lot so 
Um, you know, there's a whole lot of uh, aspects that really go under the umbrella of overlanding. And so totally. getting out there with dirt bikes or side by sides, hiking, whatever you want to do, um, you know, you really can incorporate all of it with this lifestyle. And I see you're really taking advantage of that. Yeah, we, we had a really unique opportunity about six months ago. Uh, Polaris reached out to us to help them launch a vehicle and um, basically let us borrow the thing for six months and wanted to know how it fit into our travel and our lifestyle. And we shot a couple little videos on it for them and did some photography for them as well. And, you know, they helped them cover some of our travel costs and worked out really well for both of us. We really enjoyed using it to explore if we were to get one of our own, we would need one that was street legal, uh, you know, DOT tires and plates and horn and all that stuff. Um, just too many times for, if it's going to be our scout vehicle, it needs to be able to run into town or it needs to be able to cross roads or run highway sections or whatever that, I mean, not always just be loaded on a trailer, um, and then taken off somewhere where we can mm -hmm. use it. So that was kind of, the culmination the end of the experiment of bringing a side by side but i think it's totally doable i think it's a night it's a great vehicle to explore with um the one we had had a heater in it which was really nice so when it was cold zip the windows up and run the heater and the windshield defroster yeah. and rip around when it's frosty outside you know it was it was, it was a pr pretty sweet uh addition <laughs> to the fleet for a little while that's awesome well, one of the things that people always talk about and want to know um, on the show, especially when we interview people like yourself, we know that you're a photographer, but I do know that you have uh, you, that you're working on another business to try to keep a little bit of income for gas money, um, you know, different things, insurance, whatever. Uh, so tell us um, about a normal everyday working uh, day for you and also the business that you that you're dabbling in to try to further your income. I don't know if there's such thing as a normal working day. <laughs> At least there hasn't been for a while. Um, yeah. You know, uh, some of the work we do is photography related. Some of the work we do is uh, working with brands. Uh, we, we've tried to not be a social media channel that's just stuffing brands down people's throat. But we do work with a lot of brands mm -hmm. with the stuff we do use. Um, and we offer them more photography they can use themselves versus photography that we're going to necessarily show our audience. So there's been kind of some multifaceted mm -hmm. figuring out that world. Uh, there's been some, you know, I've got a background in sales. There's been some small, smaller companies we worked with that needed help with the sales processes and consulting and doing things like that. So every once in a while I help with, with companies establishing that. And again, it's a smaller company. So it's like that huge budgets, but every little, when you're on the road, mm -hmm. every little bit helps. They need some help. It continues the relationship with that company. Um, mm -hmm. and then this summer we, we got an opportunity, some really good friends of ours bought some property in Montana, about 45 minutes South of Missoula. Uh, they're like, Hey, come park the airstream. Like, we'd love to have you just base there for the summertime. You can come and go as you please use it as a jumping off point, work on your vehicles, whatever you need to do. So we still had the Tundra. We'd already sold the flip pack. We were trying to figure out what to do with it. We had it parked at a friend's house and we're like, let's, let's put a tent in the back of it, outfit it, put a kitchen in it, make sure it's all ready to go. And put it up on one of the, the outdoorsy rental sites, did that. And then we found another deal on a fourth gen V8 forerunner that this nice guy had and already had a home built kitchen in the back of it, like drawer slide. So we modified that a little bit, added some lighting, put a root tent mm -hmm. on that, kicked off a rental company. And I mean, it at the second day, the evening of the first day we went live, the foreigner rented for 11 days. And two days later, the Tundra went out for 13 days. We're like, okay. Let's try, you know, adventure vehicle rental business. We started adding mm -hmm. you know, more information, places to go, uh, sites of interest. So we kind of wanted to build it as not just come borrow our truck, but here's some things you can do with it. Let us know what period of time you're here for in Montana. And we'll tell you some of the great places we've been. Um, and people were really mm -hmm. receptive to it. So it, yeah. you know, constantly figuring out how we continue to travel as much as possible, you know. It's been almost three years now and we're like, well, we got to go back to work at some point. But if we can go back to work and stay somewhere gorgeous like Montana for the summer and run a business up here in the summer, shut it down for the winter and then spend five months on the road and seven months working really hard. Mm. That works for us. Um, yeah. You know, maybe it grows into something else. Maybe it falls apart in a couple of years, but you got to try it at least and see if it turns into something. Uh, you know, it's That's not like we're buying million, million dollar vehicles. It's not, they're not new. It's a fourth gen V8 yeah. forerunner we bought, you know, it was under 10 yeah. grand. So it's like, <laughs> all right, well, hopefully we make that back. <laughs> like so. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, you're not going out there and buying a, you know, a expedition um, crawler vehicle or, or anything like no. that. So uh, just some, some that's reliable, capable, you know, we want to maintain, uh, you know, running Toyotas, we want our maintenance to be at a minimum. Uh, something that we're, you know, we feel confident even with a vehicle with 150, 200,000 miles on it, someone can take the thing out and they're not really going to run into anything. You know, we hmm. spec the heck out of them, make sure all the brakes are good, check all the fittings, you know, drive shafts. I mean, we kind of run through them with a fine tooth comb after each rental. And, you know, yeah. it's, it's a Toyota. You put gas in them, you do the tires and brakes and make sure the battery's good and off it goes. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. Uh, I think uh, I think that's something that that's really needed out there because you know some advice that I think a lot of us would give to those out there who are really wanting to experience with this overland lifestyle is don't go out there and spend fifty thousand dollars on uh, a lift, tires, a rear kitchen, fridge, rooftop tent, and all that. Go rent something from from Brett and take it out for ten or eleven days and see if you like it. And uh, if you like it, hey, then do the investment or rent from him again. Uh, sure. So it would be uh, it would be helpful. Uh, and, and I think we're really new to that. And uh, Frankie um, Post here in Arkansas does that as well. Thanks, Jeff, for reminding me about that. Frankie Post has um, a place here in Arkansas where you can do the same thing. So I think that's a great tool that a lot of people are not really out there using is these rental places and rent something, take it out. Do it for four or five days or even a weekend. You may get out there and say, screw this. This ain't for me. Uh, but, you know, even if you're to convince your wife that who had like yours, who had never been on a camping trip. Hey, this is something that we need to do. Well, she's not going to let you go out there and spend 50 grand on to up, upfit your vehicle to do this if it's not going to be something that she likes. So rent one of these vehicles, take it out, take her out and see if it's something she likes. I think it's a great tool uh, that a lot of people aren't utilizing. And a lot of people, you know, go out and buy, spend twenty five hundred, three grand, whatever it is, on a rooftop tent, sleeping it two nights. Like I hate this. I don't want to be up there. I don't like the way the tent works. I don't like this. Mm -hmm. I don't like that. You know, they they realize that you know one of the like turtleback trailers that folds out into a full big tent with cots makes more sense for them and the way they want to travel. They've got they want that more space. Yeah. They don't mind taking the time to set up camp. Uh, they want more comfort. They want a bigger mattress. You know, they everything's got its pros and cons. And there's you know, you may have an idea right. and we're guilty of it too. Like, Hey, this is what I want. You get out there and use it for a couple months. You're like, well, that's not really what we wanted to do. Uh, even with, you know, even once you've committed, yeah, I like this lifestyle, but I maybe don't like this equipment. So, yeah. you know, best way to do it is if there's a way for you to go try it for a couple days a week. That's the best way to find out whether you think it's going to work or not. Exactly. And, and, you, and if you've never done it before, you don't know if you're going to want to be, a base camper that that plants a trailer one place and you go out and you come back and you go out and you come back or if you're one of those people that likes to set up and take down and move to a different spot and set up and take down you know i i, I like doing both i have a trailer where i do one thing and i have a fj that's outfitted where i do both so you know you don't know what you're gonna want until you get out there and do it so you know it's um it's a uh it's a little something for everybody and i, I think you just need to uh experiment and get out there and maybe maybe rent one of these and, and try it out. Take your family out, see if it's something that they like to do. I think it's worth it well. I couldn't agree more. So where do you see yourself in five years? What what do you see uh, for the future coming up for our overland life? Where do you see yourself five years down the road? I mean, ideally, I'd like the, the rental business to be cruising in the summers and have picked up a couple more Airbnbs in a few places and get that residual money going, maybe find someone that can actually run the rental business, get a, like, you know, maybe even set it up as a shop somewhere up here um, or run it out of potentially mm -hmm. an off-road shop, maybe, uh, you know, use some of my experience to, to help people out with, with their builds. Um, it'd be kind of, I, I don't know if it's going to go that way, but it's, it's definitely a thought that's crossed my mind. Um, you know, but at the same time, it'd be nice to have somebody operating that aspect of the business that was also passionate about it. And, you know, we can keep continuing to grow from there. So uh, travel, I think, is always it, the bugs not doesn't go away. If if you get bitten and you like it, it's staying planted somewhere is yeah. probably the, the, the yeah. most painful aspect of it. You just want to get back out and do it. I mean, there's, yeah. you know, there's South America, there's Asia, there's, you know, there's there's all levels of stuff. And I think 
all levels of expedition, you know, there's the U S by itself. I mean, I've, I've got a buddy that just got done doing the trans America and he's like, I want to spend the next three years cruising around the U S he's like the America is so diverse. It's so big. It's so, you know, such mm. a different place as you cut back and forth across it. You know, people are different. The, the terrain is so different. I mean, one pine forest in the mountains is not similar to the next pine forest over in the mountains. I mean, one desert is different than yeah. the next desert, you know, is different than, you know, the the flatlands i mean it's stuff may seem pretty straightforward on its face but i mean there's just miles and miles and miles of this country to explore and you know yeah. the small towns are just as fun as getting out and getting remote yeah yeah you're right and you know i, I that, that brings me to a question that that i like to ask a lot of people especially the ones that have been doing this for a long time uh, and you've been out to the expos and i'm sure this year wasn't your first year i'm sure you've been several times but Overlanding seems to be astronomically popular right now. I mean, it's just outrageous. Uh, you see new rigs every day on the road, and the the numbers that the expos are putting out there of attendees and and you know if you go out into if you go to Ure or if you go to one of the popular places in in uh, Utah, there's just people everywhere. Um, do you see? overlanding as a fad that will fade into the distance in a few years or do you see it as something that will stick around for quite a while in the united states i think it's something that's going to stick around the united states i've had conversations with plenty of international travelers that are just like this country is so easy to move in it is so unbelievably beautiful it is if you do it right it's relatively inexpensive to move through i mean fuel costs or fuel costs wherever you are in the world um, mm -hmm. but it's, it is an easy country to overland travel. It's an easy country to go camp. It's an easy, it's got lots of cell service. It's got lots of Wi-Fi. The language is easy for most people. I mean, it's mm -hmm. most places are welcoming for you to be there. Um, you know, it's, I don't think it's a fad at all. I mean, I I've talked to some guys that had companies that, that they started in Australia and they're like, this is Australia 30 years ago. And it, yeah. it, went to them i mean if you look at what the overland businesses in australia i mean they're the you know they're basically what most people want to compare their brands to is an australian brand or you know an african right. north african brand or south african brand i mean overlanding's been big in both places but the growth of the industry they said right now in the u.s feels like the earlier days in australia and they're like it's you guys haven't seen anything yet yeah why That's do you think it's taken so long to take off here when uh, South Africa and Australia has been doing it for 30 years. Why, why do you think it took so long for that um, love for overland based travel to get to the United States? Um, I don't know. I think Amer the United States already had so many hobbies. You know, we've got people mm -hmm. going to the dunes. We've got rock crawlers. We've got, you know, dirt bike riders and there's UTV people. And there's, you know, there's People just want to go hunting. People just want to go fishing. People just want to, you know, we already have had a bunch of hobbies. It was another hobby. I think there's resistance to, you know, well, Overland is only this cross country, multifaceted version of travel. And that is some people's decision, you know, yeah. uh, you know, sure. Is it just an over glamorized word for camping traveling? Sure. Um, but yeah. it, it, the method that we do it, the way that you move frequently, the, you know, whether you're doing it for a week at a time or whether you're doing it for years at a time, if you're, it's vehicular based travel, you're living out of your rig for extended periods of time. I don't, I think that's the easiest definition of overlanding. Um, yeah. And just the, the want to, to experience cultures and to experience nature and to be off the beaten path and, you know, that's all kind of what overlanding is. And I think it was hard to maybe break that definition earlier on. Um, but yeah, I mean, even in, even since we, I would say we've been doing it since 2014 is kind of when we started. I mean, I've always camped. I didn't have yeah. a name, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. before wife, it was I, overlanding, we just, right. camped. <laughs> yeah, in 07, my wife and I would travel across the country in the back of that Oh four Tundra with this camper shell on the back. And we had a, an air mattress with all of our bedding and pillows. We'd empty it down to about half and flip it over in the morning. And I had two bins in the yeah. cooler. We'd go in the back and we'd drive to the next campsite or wherever we found a camp, unload all the bins, cook dinner, you know, fold the air mattress out, fill it up, throw the bins in the cab, go to sleep, get up in the morning, empty it, 
flip them all back in the cab and go again. So, I mean, we were traveling every single day. We, we were yeah. changing camp yeah. all the time. We were back roads. We were highways. We were stopping in small towns. We were having coffee and ice cream and checking out the biggest ball of yarn and the world's largest frying pan. And like, sure, it's travel, but it's it's that yeah. that that want of exploration that need to keep moving and moving and changing and seeing new stuff and and you know route you know coming in line with fellow travelers from all over the world i mean we had we were camped in utah one night and this guy rolls up on our campsite in a diesel manual transmission all-wheel drive volkswagen california pop top camper thing and the guy gets six months a year to travel outside of denmark i think and he just backs it up drives for six months meets up with friends says he's out with family gets to as far as he gets goes wherever the heck he wants puts the thing in storage flies home six months later he's back gets in the thing goes as far as he can guy does wow. it every six months i mean he's retired that's all he wants to do he's like i can be out of the country for six months at a time that's what i'm gonna do and he's rolled up the camp like next thing you know we got a fire going we're like come out come out hang out at the fire he's telling stories yeah. and sharing whiskey and you know just meeting other travelers naturally out out in the wild and you know you never know who that is rolling yeah. up on your camp but it's not always a bad thing sometimes it's that's true really awesome so that's true well i you know uh 40 years ago in the 70s uh living in your van there was kind of a stigma that went with that uh you had to be a long-haired hippie smoking weed every day you know it's and it, since then it's it's changed a little bit because you know um uh, man, I used, to, uh, I started out in a Suzuki Samurai, uh, and I would take that thing anywhere. There was not anywhere in this world. I would not take that thing. It would go anywhere. Um, yep. you know, and, and we moved from that to motorcycles and I had a motorcycle trailer. Me and my wife would hook that motorcycle trailer up and we would travel all over. Uh, we would go from state to state, to state, set our tent up out in the middle of nowhere and just have the time of our life. And then it moved to vehicle base camping and so it's kind of evolved for us a little bit but um and i think it's evolved for the united states as well um it's it was you know you're not that old man living in your van down by the river you know that's that's what we say here in the south when when you're the little crazy man well you look like the guy who does it but you know you know (laughs) but but now it's become a popular thing that that stigma is not there anymore the living the van life is actually the end thing to do for young 20 year olds, you know, and, and, you know, back when I was a kid, I'm, I don't know how old you are, Brett, but I'm 50. I turned 50 in May. So you're probably close to me. You're probably 43. Okay. Um, But when I was a kid, um, you know, I, I think we learned from our parents, like you said, you traveled around as an air force brat. Well, my dad taught college. So we had the little corner house white house with the picket fence. And I thought that was what I should do as well. And I didn't think there were really any other options for me. You know, my dad wasn't in the military. We, we moved around a lot, but it was from house to house to house and from job to job to job. So I thought my goal in life was to be like my parents and, and to have that job, that income, have a family, a wife and three kids, two dogs, whatever. And it really didn't seem like an option, but now, the the kids that are out there they see it as um a viable option um where there's a lot more ways that you can make a living from the road you don't have to have a nine to five where you travel and commute 30 minutes and then come back home it's there with the internet with social media uh there's so many more options out there for people to take advantage of this lifestyle and i think that's why it's really booming here in the united states Come on, Elon. Let's get those all those satellites up. We're ready. Oh man, that won't that be nice? Have a yeah. Wi-Fi yeah. anywhere in the world. It'll be nice. It'll be Oof. it'll suck, but it'll also be nice. Uh, there's some aspects that yeah. you know aren't so great about it, but generally, you know, even for what we do, being able to up being you know not have to go find a town to upload imagery or you know deal with client files or do invoicing or all the stuff that's a facet of running whatever business you have. You know, it's. It'll be really nice. But that's the thing that, you know, that's why van life is so accessible. You know, so many people are able to get jobs where they work remote. Um, Prior to hitting the road, I had talked my company I was working with into letting me have two weeks, um, uh, two weeks every month. I was in the office and two weeks a month I was on the road remote. Um, 
And, you know, we basically the middle two weeks every month we were on the road traveling, which was kind of like the stepping off launching point for us hitting the road full time. And, you know, I kept telling a lot of people ask, like, oh, how does that work? How does your office? You know, I was like, it took five years to talk them to let me do it. And then once they did it, you know, they weren't even convinced initially that it was working. But I mean, my whole statement was to to work remote. One must work like, you know, you actually have to get the work done. They have to yeah. see the results. And, you know, <laughs> you rolled into camp Sunday night and yeah. you pulled up, you pulled up your, your phone service and man, I'm streaming YouTube. I got tons of service. This is going to be great. You wake up yeah. Monday. I can't tell you how many times we woke up Monday morning, no service. Emails aren't loading. You're just freaking out. You got to pack up camp. She's like, we're going to hang out here for two days and get work done. You're packing camp up, trying to remember where you had service back down the road. <laughs> then you're in some, you know, you're in this beautiful epic location. Yeah. You used to have service. And now you're somewhere subpar because it does have service or you're in a coffee shop or at a brewery or just hanging out somewhere yeah. where you can get some work done uh, and get caught up since you're already, you know, hours behind by the time you get started. So, yeah, is it all puppies and rainbows and free right. and amazing and gorgeous? Right. No, there's a lot of work involved, but you got you got problems living in a house just like you do living on the road. Exactly. Exactly. Well, hey, we uh, we're coming uh, up to the end of, uh, you know, we're about about to hit an hour where we like to to cut it off. And we've crammed a lot into an hour. But but tell us, do you have any events that you're that you have coming up where you're going to be in the next uh, month or two? What's what's your travel schedule like for the next couple months? Uh, I think next weekend, my wife Lizzie's going to be out in California at the October Olaf event up in Big Bear. Um October Fe Olaf October Festivus event. I think it's sold out already, um, but it's supposed to be a pretty sweet event. Wow. Then she's she's joining uh, her friend Jillian. They've got one of their, I think, last of the year ladies camp out trips. They're doing up in they're doing their Oregon edition in Southern Oregon, yeah, Oregon. and mm -hmm. and I'll be meeting up with her after that. And then Lizzie and I are going to kind of take our time trailing back over towards Montana, and then I think we're mostly done for uh, for events for the rest of the year until the springtime. Um, yeah. there is some talk about maybe going down to Baja for January. Uh, and there's a, sounds like there's a big group of travelers headed down there for January. So we may, we may try to link up with a bunch of them, be anywhere from 15 to 30 rigs deep, hanging out on the beach, eating tacos and surfing and paddleboarding. Wow. And I mean, that's kind of, kind of like so that's kind of where we're leaning now. So as long as the borders uh, stay solid enough to be able to do that, that's, that's, that's the plan at the moment that, you know. You got to be that's flexible. Awesome. Things can change at any moment. So that's right. That's right. Well, tell everybody where they can find you on social media, YouTube, whatever, so they can keep up with where you are and what you're doing. You bet. Our Overland Life on Instagram is all one word, is probably the best place to see. We just started a YouTube channel. Uh, it seems like it's grown pretty quick. Uh, we started two and a half months ago, and there's like 300 followers. If you want to follow on there, right now we're putting up uh, some trip recaps and we're doing. Um, a lot of my old DIY builds, people didn't know where I, they could reference those. So you'll see some older stuff that was filmed vertical format, like on the phones, because that's what we did on Instagram. Uh, so I'm just getting those up yep. so that there's a reference point so people can see how I've built stuff or how we've done things in the past. Uh, so those those will get better. But for now, we're just plant, trying to play some catch up and get those up. Uh, and then we hope to be doing some equipment reviews of just some of the stuff we've been beating up over the last three years. You know, there's a lot of stuff we've got that we awesome. use on a daily basis that's held up really well. And there's stuff that didn't make it a month. Um, so, you know, we want to kind of yeah. share some of that knowledge with people too. Uh, and then other than that, if you do want to come out to Montana, rent one of our trucks, Roam Camp Repeat, uh, find us on the website or the Instagram. Uh, that's the account for that. So that'll kind of be our, our new push to get Roam Camp Repeat up and running and shoot us an inquiry. Let us know when you want to come out and we'll get a quote your way. Very good. Very good. I love it. Well, Brett, I appreciate you coming on here, taking time out of your day and, and uh, evening away from your wife to come out and uh, join us on here and let us get to know you a little better. Really hope I run into that gigantic van out in the middle of nowhere somewhere. I think that'd be pretty cool. Uh, yeah, and uh, I'm sure that we'll meet up at one of the expos coming up because uh, I think you're probably a staple at those every year. So uh, that'll be pretty fun. That'll be pretty yeah. fun. Look forward to it. That'd be awesome. Awesome. Well, everybody, thank you for joining in on us and uh, talking with me and Brad. And thank you for all your comments and questions. Hope you get out there and enjoy yourself. Hope to see you at Rendezvous starting on Thursday this week up in Oark, Arkansas. If you're out this way, make sure you get up there and come by and see us. For everyone out there, 
live your best life. Watch out for number one and don't step in number two. Have a good one. I'm Mason Berry with Blue Line Overlook. Hi, I'm Jeff from Dance, baby, dance, baby. Thank you for watching. Professor. 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 Professor and friends. Sponsored by U.S. Action Tracks, Vincent and Solar, More Expo, Big Iron Overland Rally. Blue Cell Coffee Roasters, Long Creek Overland Apparel, and our good friends at Artemis Overland Hardware. Thank you for watching our show. We'll see you next time.